COVID-19 has challenged healthcare systems across Europe in a way never thought possible. The speed at which professionals have responded and collaborated has minimised loss of life and allowed sharing of knowledge and good practices. Dr Montesinos describes the frontline in Spain and how, with growing numbers of infections, radiology plays an important role in triaging COVID-19 cases and improved patient pathways. In March 2020, we were surprised by a new and unknown situation. In Spain, we had to activate many defense mechanisms to be able to deal with a very contagious disease in a very short time, like uh, social distance, only, only urgent patients, different pathways for suspicious and not suspicious patients. Changes needed to be made throughout the entire patient pathway and the different steps of the patient care continuum. More support was needed from patient admissions, diagnosis and monitoring to treatment and follow-up. In parallel, more clinical information needed to be made available for clinical research so that HCPs could access better ways of defining and diagnosing patients. The first major challenge all hospitals around Europe faced was the need to significantly increase the number of ICU beds. Many hospitals resorted to creating ICUs in other hospital departments. For example, in Portsmouth Hospital in the UK, the number of beds went up to 60 from 24 by repurposing other departments. And in Ghent University Hospital in Belgium, the ICU took over the post-anesthesia care and coronary care units. Here, Dr. Steve Mathieu and Dr. Kristin Kolpert explain the transformations in Portsmouth and Ghent. We've actually expanded our critical care footprint into other areas such as respiratory high care and into theatre recovery, um, which has allowed us to potentially increase our capacity from 24 beds uh, up to uh, around sort of 60 beds if we needed it. Before the COVID, our ICU has uh, 52 ICU beds for adult patients and 16 uh, ICU beds for pediatric patients. Uh, these are all equipped with uh, centricity critical care. Um, so, due to the COVID uh, crisis, we increased also uh, to the post anesthesia care uh, unit. Uh, we increased the number of beds there and also uh, the coronary uh, care unit as well. In both cases, the clinical teams could rely on their existing digital solution to provide them with an overview of every patient's data across these newly formed ICU departments and the growing number of ICU beds without the need for additional paperwork, admin or training. We did not want it to go uh, back on paper as we did uh, many, many, many years ago uh, because uh, by using the digital system, we could keep an overview of, of our patients, uh, not only for hemodynamics and ventilation and infection, uh, but also for the status of the COVID parameters as well. So we kept a, a very good overview over all parameters uh, by using the digital system, also in the other wards, in the post anesthesia care unit and the coronary care unit, where our normal ICU patients were located. It's more or less the same as the normal ICU patient. Uh, that's my impression. So in terms of keeping an overview of the patient, uh, it's made uh, relatively simple by our existing um, EPR that we've got, um, which is Centricity Critical Care. Um, what it has shown is the, to us anyway, is the value of that because uh, with the need to rapidly upscale, we haven't been able to reproduce that electronic solution in some of the other pod areas that we use. So the patients that we've got on critical care, we can get a very quick overview of uh, which patients we've got. Um, we can identify the important details that we need to about those patients in terms of their physiology, uh, their lab results, 
uh, their documentation, get a very quick um, sense of, 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 of the type of patients and, the, and their main problems and, and plans by, by using our existing setup. Um, that doesn't mean it's insurmountable in the other areas, but I think what it has done is it's, it's uh, reminded of us what life was like 10 years ago before we had our EPLR, or EPR rather, um, and, and we've had to use paper, we've had to go back to paper, uh, and use paper charts uh, and paper notes. Centricity Critical Care has enabled the teams to improve monitoring of COVID-19 patients by extending their ICU patient parameters to include new graphs, trend pages and COVID-specific parameters such as ferritin, LDH and eosinophils. This has been especially helpful as the number of patients in ICU has grown and senior staff numbers are in short supply, particularly during the night or at weekends. We also installed uh, an additional trend uh, graphs. Um, so we created special trend pages uh, in order to have a big overview, a great overview for the patients, not only for the normal parameters for hemodynamics and ventilation and infection, and liver and kidney uh, function, all these things. But also we included uh, specific uh, sections for COVID parameters like ferritin, LDH, eosinophils, uh, And also we included the, um, the view uh, in the trends of be patients being prone or uh, being on ECMO. So that was something we previously did not include it into the trend pages, but we included it uh, from the start of the COVID uh, pandemic in order to have a big, uh, nice overview of which patient was prone and then additionally on ECMO and then afterwards uh, weaned from the ventilation. So we had a big uh, overview, um, a great overview on these patients. We included it uh, from the start of the COVID uh, pandemic in order to have a big, uh, nice overview of which patient was prone and then additionally on ECMO and then afterwards uh, weaned from the ventilation. So we had a big uh, overview, um, a great overview on these patients because we are on duty for uh, all these patients with uh, one or uh, two uh, at maximum senior staff members at night or at the weekend. So if you have uh, 40, 50 patients or more on ventilation, um, it's impossible to have a great overview of these patients if you don't have a digital solution. So what I can quickly get is a snapshot of what their physiology is, what their lab results look like, um, have the trends changed, uh, what were their last blood culture results, and, and actually what were the sensitivities to those organisms that they've grown, and what antibiotics they are on, how long have they been on them, and should I be changing them? Many COVID patients in ICU present with similar difficulties. Because the existing digital monitoring was in place and working well, it meant that in Ghent, the workflow for ICU staff was simplified so they could spend their time concentrating on helping the COVID patients with the most complex ventilation and kidney problems. Most of my colleagues agree that working for COVID patients was more stable than working for the most critically ill patients uh, because they were used to working with a system that was nothing different than before and COVID patients are very similar in their clinical course. They are difficult to ventilate, um, they get prone ventilation, some get ECMO ventilation, but it's mostly a ventilation problem and a sedation problem. Some of them, them have also uh, kidney problems, but we didn't see that very often. But that's the, the, the main uh, course in these COVID patients. And because we were used to working with the digital system, we didn't have extra burden on working with these new kind of patients. So we had all the time and the possibilities to focus on the treatment of the patient and not on uh, having, uh, being able to have an overview of these patients because that's, we were used to the system as well. 
In contrast, paper-based reporting as part of the patient workflow can have disadvantages, especially with staff working at 200% capacity. Looking up historic information from previous days can be prone to error, and this can affect how treatment is impacting the patient. Whilst that's not difficult to do when you're at normal critical care capacity, it's much harder to do these things when you're running at 100, 200% plus of your normal capacity with your staffing levels as they are. So it's really important to be able to have processes and, 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 and get data um, efficiently. Um, there's other things as well. I think, you know, I think, I think what you can always have with uh, the EPR, which you can't always have with papers, consistency in terms of legibility of notes, drugs prescribing, um, even simple things like how notes are standardised. So if everyone writes notes in a different way, when I want to look back at what's been going on three, four, five days ago, I just need that one bit of information. It's much harder to pick it out because I haven't got a standard, standardised template the way the note is, is written. So, so that's, you know, that's what we definitely do have with, with, with EPR. With a huge increase in patient numbers arriving at emergency departments, many of whom had COVID-19, triaging the most critical cases was very important. X-ray technologies, such as digital tomosynthesis, played an increasingly valuable role to quickly assess pneumonia, indicative in serious COVID-19 cases, to help prioritise care for those patients before lab results were available. Dr. Blanco and Dr. Placentia describe their experiences in Spain and how the use of X-ray technology helped triage patients. We did not have enough portable X-ray equipment to cover the increased patient demand, and some were uh, some of the machines were quite old. At any time during the pandemic, Czech X-ray has been widely demanded. But in all waves, the Czech X-ray has uh, had an important role in detecting pneumonia and for close monitoring for COVID-19 patients. The main challenges faced by the crisis have been the high volume of patients with COVID-19, which, which practically has replaced all the other patients. Also, the need for a fast radiological diagnosis for isolation and this has led to a high daily volume of checks x-rays. Also, the risk of contagion and the lack of an adequate personal protective equipment in the first wave. Currently, protective equipment is available, but the technicians end up exhausted by the slowness to dress and undress in the face of a huge, huge volume of daily checks x-rays. In these uh, first uh, days of the pandemic in March, laboratory testing was not available or results were in many cases very delayed. So suspicion of COVID-19 relied on chest imaging in symptomatic patients. So uh, we decided to try digital tomosynthesis to uh, see if it could be helpful uh, to depict subtle abnormalities um, uh, based on previous experiences with uh, tomosynthesis in um, the depiction of lung nodules. With COVID-19 patients in different settings, at hospital, in nursing homes or at home, Dr. Placentia and Dr. Blanco describe their innovative response and how X-ray technology has been used to monitor patients quickly and safely in mobile units, in primary care and in hospital. Concerning how we manage our front light equipment to cope uh, with this high volume of patients and the need for a fast diagnosis, we must differentiate three groups of patients. The hospitalized patients, the patient in a nursing home, and the isolated patient at home. Increasing the technician staff and the number of portable equipment was the strategy for the volume of hospitalized patients with four times the usual number of portable X-ray in the third waves compared with the normal situation. 
regularly taking our portable equipment to provide radiological care not at home has been crucial and much appreciated by the physician in charge of this fragile group. So to cope with the high volume of patients that needed imaging and fast diagnosis, so there were thousands of home confined patients uh, with clinical suspicion of COVID-19 and many patients ended up needing imaging because of clinical concerns. So our radiology department implemented a high resolution radiology service in the emergency radiology area to assist all those patients by providing immediate imaging and reports. To do that, we used the volume rod equipment that was available in the emergency. We used it for these home confined patients and the uh, patients in the emergency department that uh, were mobile and could come walk into the room. And finally, the group of patients isolated at home has been the largest group. This ha the, they have been monitored by phone by primary care physician and when worsening it was suspected, sending the patient to the emergency department was an option, but it would lead to an unsustainable overload in the short term. So we offer a specific radiological high resolution service to this group of patients for assessing the possibility of pneumonia. The chest tomosynthesis technique was later added after checking his potential as well as asymmetry. The use of X-ray technology hasn't just improved triage and taken pressure off ER departments. It has also made a big difference to workflows. It has allowed radiologists to maintain a safe physical distance from patients. And it has enabled observation of different clinical standpoints in patients with varying degrees of infection. Given the large volume of COVID-19 patients and the risk of contagion, the service was organized with the capacity for a large number of patients with the minimum waiting time, with possibility for performing the exam in less than 24 hours, coverage 12 hours a day, 7 days a week, with patients scheduled every 15 or 10 minutes. Radiological resources were reorganized to give priority to COVID-19 patients. The work of our radio radiology residents was fundamental to speed up the radiology report. Um, the advantages of a volume rod that we found uh, for imaging uh, COVID-19 patients uh, at the beginning we we started using just uh, uh, conventional x-ray um, well the equipment is fast and allows high quality imaging it allowed also safe distancing between technicians and patients as it could be managed with a remote control um, it allowed rapid turnaround of patients and easy cleaning compared to other equipments like uh, the CT scan so uh, this is um, these are some images of our equipment in the emergency area. Um, as you can see, the, the patients could walk in and place themselves in the front of the, of the panel. And um, the technician didn't uh, need to, uh, to touch them, allowed security distance, and also the um, uh, remote control um, uh, allowed the technician to operate the equipment um, with um, security distance. The patient diagnosis pathway begins in the radiology department. The, re the radiologist decides the next step for the patient. When pneumonia or low oximetry was detected, the patient is sent to the emergency department for assessing the hospital admission need. Otherwise, the patient is sent home for keeping follow-up by phone. Since starting the higher resolution service in green in the graph, the volume of patients assessed in the, ready, in the emergency department dropped drastically. After three weeks, a similar number of patients were assessed through the emergency department and through the high resolution service. 
a maximum of 42 patients per day were assessed during the first wave through the high-resolution service. But in the third wave, we reached 80 patients in one day, and this notably relieved the emergency department in blue in the graph. Today, a new radiological room with tomosynthesis has allowed us to double our radiological capacity if necessary. We found uh, that it was really helpful because it allowed, um, by removing overlying structures, uh, to see better subtle abnormalities. So um, um, we could depict subtle opacities consistent with COVID-19 that were not visible on chest X-ray. Um, it allowed detection of bilateral lesions, very typical of COVID-19. Um, also helpful to exclude doubtful, doubtful findings um, on chest X-ray. And depiction of other abnormalities and patterns of lung infection non-consistent with uh, COVID-19. Um, the only limitation is that a time acquisition of the TOM synthesis is um, 11 seconds, so uh, patients have to hold their breath for this uh, time lapse. And uh, this was not a problem for all these patients that came walking and um, could um, had were not very affected, so uh, could hold their breath without problems. Mm, and for those who were uh, really sick, we uh, we usually used a uh, portable X-ray. The tomosynthesis techniques technique contributed to significantly to conventional check X-ray in about 20 to 27% of the patients. In about half of the cases, it helped us to detect new or more extensive opacities and in the other half to rule out doubtful opacities on check X-ray. Therefore, tomosynthesis has contributed to increase the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy for identified pneumonic opacity compared to conventional check X-ray, and it has been key for our initial diagnosis of pneumonia, for assessing the evolution of the pneumonia, and we believe that also in the certain prognosis as a tool to anticipate the need for possible respiratory support. Regarding the benefits of volume rat for COVID-19 patient, I will try to show you two representative cases. In the first case, the presence of abnormality in the chest X-ray can be very doubtful. However, the tomosynthesis exam shows an extensive involvement with multifocal bilateral small opacities difficult to detect in conventional chest X-ray. In the second case, we have a conventional chest X-ray on the left and some tomosynthesis images on the right. And by avoiding the overlapping of structures in tomosynthesis, we can appreciate the target sign in both lower, 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 uh, lower lung lows, highly specific for COVID-19, and not evident in conventional checks X-ray. CT scans contribute significantly to the rapid diagnosis of COVID-19. In France, as in many areas, the huge challenge has been to deal with the large number of patients presenting with COVID-19 symptoms who are admitted and have to wait for a CT scan. At the University Hospital Henri Mondor in France, Professor Alain Luciani and his team have adopted an innovative solution to increase the speed of CT scanning, to increase the speed of diagnosis, so treatment can commence for patients where every second counts. So dealing with patients with COVID in the intensive care unit is something uh, very special. Uh, those patients are very fragile in terms of uh, respiratory condition, of course. They face different complications and CT is there to detect those complications. By the end of March, uh, our hospital decided that we were to increase the intensive care unit uh, number of beds, the number of beds in the intensive care unit here at the University Hospital Henri Mondor. Actually, that was the creation 
uh, of 86 intensive care beds. Uh, we are usually dealing with 90 beds at the, at the hospital, so that was actually doubling the number of beds in the ICU. So how do we deal with that? The first thing is we have to do it uh, in a rush. The, the second thing is we have to provide the best imaging uh, to those patients in the intensive care unit. And we have to have a new CT device brought to the, uh, to the facility so that we can take care of the patients. By the end of March, is we turned to GE Healthcare and said, okay, how can you help us? We have uh, three CTs already fully busy at the hospital. How can we create a fourth one but not in one month, not in three weeks, but just in 10 days. And uh, here we are 10 days after and the CT is arriving. As you can see right behind me, the CT is now uh, going to be loaded within the containers that have been brought and built, designed as we liked to deal with those patients in ICU with COVID. And uh, we are ready to go. I would just like to say some words because that was a, a, an adventure really, an adventure for us, an adventure for GE Healthcare, but also an adventure for all those um, workers that have been working night and day throughout France to build those containers to make sure that those containers will be delivered today out at our academic hospital. So for our patients, for us, thanks for providing and being successful at this challenge. Recently developed AI tools have proved to be another great way to enhance the imaging workflow and give clinicians more confidence at the point of care, especially with the intubation of COVID-19 patients, which can be a complicated procedure. Improvements to the radiology workflow with embedded artificial intelligence AI tools in the radiology platform have alleviated some of the increasing time pressures under which technologists and radiologists operate. As we well know, during last year, the number of tests X-rays performed daily has multiplied due to COVID-19 crisis and the high volume of patients. For this reason, we have been forced to acquire two more portable X-ray machines in addition to the one we already have. We've gone from doing an average of 20 X-rays a day to 120, especially during the second and third peaks of the pandemic which is why it has been especially useful for these patients to benefit from critical care suit because the time that has passed since technicians do the x-ray until the radiologist read them has decreased, so it improved the, their prognosis. It has been an assistance that has never existed before to prioritize patients in very bad clinical conditions. All cases are still manually reviewed by a radiologist, but new AI solutions are helping to support the reading of scans and help prioritize critical cases by helping to detect subtle or complex patterns within patient image. This results in improvements across the board in efficiency, quality and clinical accuracy and ultimately improves patient treatment. Many patients referred to ICU have required endothracial intubation in addition to other invasive interventions. These procedures are especially prone to causing pneumothorax, so the main benefit of critical care suit I saw was the ability to advance the pneumothorax diagnose from the largest to the smallest ones that would go unnoticed even by the best radiologists. At the very beginning of the application installation, I got a call from a technician and during the night because he wondered if he saw the alarm sign in the display of the X-ray system. And thanks to this call, we could diagnose these patients early and in other, that in other situations would need six hours or more to get it. And this is really the most important future of uh, the algorithm because we can early diagnose critical condition, uh, critical patients. 
the technicians think that it's very useful because the artificial intelligence algorithm ensures that the image quality is optimum and that all the land is inside the image, meaning that if they need to retake the image, they will do it at that time, reducing the time consuming of the displacements. They also like that the algorithm fits the image to the proper position and that makes the work lives easier. Using this tool means better care for our patients because we will be able to focus our effort and our time on the pathology that the patient suffers. At GE Healthcare, we have a pipeline of solutions to assist hospitals in speeding up diagnostics, providing accurate information at the touch of a button, and automating as many tasks as possible to free up valuable clinical time that should be spent delivering best in-class patient care. We've been honored to support clinicians and patients throughout the global pandemic, and will continue to innovate and assist healthcare professionals wherever we can. Whilst hospitals have been coping with the sheer numbers of patients being admitted to hospital, they have also been very mindful of the importance of contributing to clinical research to answer the numerous COVID-19 related questions. This global pandemic has been caused by a new virus, and in these situations, it's essential to share as much data as possible. I think it's really important because at the end of the day, we're all learning about new diseases. Um, you know, we know the bread and butter of medicine, we know what we need to do, but whenever we're faced with something different, we need to be able to adapt, share, communicate, um, make sure that we're following evidence that based practice quickly and early. In order to do that, we've got to be able to share that data with others, because if we share that and we share it um, you know, widely, what it allows us to do is inform best practice much more quickly uh, and be able to treat things better for the future. So it is absolutely important, but also we, you know, we need to think about data sharing for other reasons because it will allow us to establish uh, predictive modelings, how we prognosticate, um, when we need to think about changing our treatment strategies. Um, and the other thing there is research data because obviously if we all um, are supporting research what it will allow us to do is get the answers that we need to give the best treatment for the patients. So, so research has been a very important part of this and, um, um, uh, and there have been some very important research studies that have been conducted in UK and internationally. Clinical information systems are key in speeding up the collection of patient data to feed into research projects. Collating data manually on the scale that is needed is simply not an option, as Dr. Richard Ferrer explains here. Yes, uh, so we have a, a project which is uh, have an important grant from the Ministry of Health. I am one of the coordinators of this project and we are trying to collect um, patients with COVID-19 pneumonia admitted in the ICU, so severe severe RDS pneumonia patients. And of course, we're going to collect uh, almost every detail of those patients. And if you have to go patient by patient with uh, uh, and do it manually, it will take close to six or seven hours per patient. So uh, we're planning to collect 6,000 6, patients. And I think the only way of doing that with such amount of variables is using the information that, in fact, it's in the clinical information systems. Most of the work will be automatized also in the ICU. But the first step for doing that, we need that all the devices that support the patient or monitor the patient are interconnected through clinical information systems. At the Morales Meseguer Hospital in Spain, the new workflow not only significantly improved time to triage critical patients, but also inspired the clinical team to further develop their care pathway for COVID-19 patients. 
In the first wave, 74% of the patients with normal check X-ray and oximetry got back home without going to the emergency department. And the time span of the patient in the higher resolution service was 5.6 times shorter than for patients arriving to the emergency department regardless of their destination, home or admission. And the implementation of the higher resolution service didn't result in a radiological delay for patients arriving to the emergency department, with which, of course, also were assessed by checks X-ray and by tomosynthesis. Given the, per the performance achieved with the high resolution service, we have developed new clinical pathways for following a patient with pneumonia kept at home with similar approach. So um, I want to show you some of these uh, images and advantages that we found. For example, this patient here, you can see how uh, the breasts um, don't allow a uh, good um, visualization of the of the lungs in this area. So it was hard to see if there was um, any abnormality, but with the tomosynthesis, um, it is very well depicted the presence of um, uh, multiple uh, opacities in the lower lobe, um, also with a posterior location very typical of COVID-19 and also contralateral opacities um, which are which are also typical um, and this patient ended up testing positive for um, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, other patterns that uh, could be seen with the um, tomosynthesis like in this patient he had uh, extensive um, opacities peripheral that could be seen on the x-ray but for example uh, have a look how tomosynthesis allowed us to see this beautiful honeycomb pattern in uh, in the posterior lower lobes um, very typical of this uh, COVID-19 infection or these are the case of another uh, female patient um, um, where it was hard to see uh, whether there was any uh, opacity, peripheral opacity. We could see it was not completely clear, the lungs, but then with Thomas synthesis, we can see very well the presence of multiple opacities, but in this case, they were not peripheral. There were, they were nodular very uh, typical centrilobular opacities with a branching distribution, typical pattern, tree in bad pattern. Have a look at this close image is very nice. Tree in bad pattern, typical of bacterial infections um, that are spread uh, in the uh, small airways. And this was a uh, mycoplasma pneumonia confirmed uh, in pneumonia and the patient was SARS-CoV-2 negative. So very useful to see the typical uh, presentation and also to see other patterns that excluded uh, COVID. Um, and uh, the impact of using volume rod in our ability to manage the crisis um, as, um, as I have uh, shown, um, has been and is still is very extensive. Um, in the first wave, as um, as you have you have seen, digital tomosynthesis allowed a much better depiction of pulmonary opacities, so it was of great help for an accurate diagnosis. Uh, for the second and third waves, uh, the patients. Uh, already came or are coming with a confirmed diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So our role is not to confirm diagnosis, but the goal here is to evaluate the presence and extension of lung opacities, which is important for clinical management and risk stratification. For Professor Della Bruce, the question was more around determining the best types of examination to perform for severe cases of COVID patients. 
He has been running multiple research projects and clinical studies to increase clinical confidence and improve patient care. This short webinar looks at his qualitative approach and summarises the key points from the papers he has recently published in the last 12 months. Hello to everybody. I'm uh, Eric Delabrousse. I'm a radiologist and uh, the head of the Department of Radiology in Besançon, University Hospital in France. Um, the presentation I'm going to give you today uh, is entitled COVID-19 Pneumonia, Microvascular Disease Revealed on Pulmonary DECT Angiography. A few words of introduction. Only a small proportion of patients infected develops a severe form. And the severe form of COVID-19 is pneumonia. Then, Imaging to perform is computed tomography. The two objectives of computed tomography are first, to characterize the lesions, second, to quantify the severity of the disease. To address these two objectives, international guidelines was drafted in support to perform an enhanced chest CT. But there was a first problem. This problem was the mismatch we saw between CT lesions and the clinical status of some severe patients. What was our hypothesis? Our hypothesis was that there are two reasons to be epoxic. First, the ventilatory cause. Second, the vascular cause. What were, was our decision? Our decision was to replace unannounced chest CT by pulmonary CT angiography in all our severe COVID-19 patients. We did that and we wrote a paper that was published in Radiology in April. This paper, which title is Acute Pulmonary Embolism Associated with COVID-19 Pneumonia Detected with Pulmonary CT Angiography, was the very first paper on this special topic. What were the results of this study? The main result was an astonishing rate of 23% of pulmonary embolism in our severe COVID-19 patients. Interestingly, most of the pulmonary embolism we saw were segmental or subsegmental. That was soon confirmed by postmortem and hematological studies showing pulmonary microvascular thrombosis, especially at electronic microscopy. The problem remained. This problem was that pulmonary microvascular thrombosis may be probably underestimated by pulmonary CT angiography. What was our idea? Our idea was that pulmonary DECT angiography may provide valuable information on microvascular thrombosis in COVID-19 patients. And we wrote a second original article on this very topic. This article was published in July in Quantitative Imaging in Medicine and Surgery. And uh, the objective of this study was to describe lung perfusion disorders assessed by pulmonary DECT angiography in severe COVID-19 patients. What was the protocol of our study? Our protocol was the following. 
CT scans were acquired in dual energy mode on our Revolution CT scanner after intravenous injection of 70 milliliters of contrast agent. The contrast was triggered on the main pulmonary arteries. To, uh, to analyze our series, we use some specific tools. The first one with the ultra-fast or rapid KV switching, allowed by the Gemstone GSI technique provided by General Electric and uh, present on our Revolution CT scan. The second tool was a post-processing software, uh, special, specially uh, uh, built and imagined for DCT imaging, and which is called thoracic VCAR pulmonology, that allowed automated lung segmentation and quantitative measurement. The results of this study were, were the following. Result one, Yodin map is extremely heterogeneous in COVID-19 patients with pneumonia. Result two, Surprisingly, ischemic areas predominate in normal parenchyma when we thought that it could be in consolidations or in ground glass lesions. Second, uh, result three, ischemic areas secondary to visible pulmonary artery thrombosis are the most frequent and are often large, uh, as we can see on the right image. Result four, and the most interesting result, in my opinion, small ischemic areas are seen even in the absence of visible pulmonary artery thrombosis at pulmonary CT angiography. In conclusion, Pulmonary CT angiography is mandatory in all severe COVID-19 patients. DCT with Yodin maps is the only imaging tool that allows for the diagnosis of ischemic areas due to microvascular thrombosis associated with COVID-19. We can safely say that clinical teams across Europe are fighting COVID-19 on all fronts. Radiology departments have had exceptional demands placed on them. But with tools like CCS and adopting aspects of machine learning, their workflows have been more manageable and patient care has been improved. At GE Healthcare, we feel privileged to support many hospitals as they continue to do battle with COVID-19 and face future challenges where using radiology to help with efficient workflows, reliable patient monitoring and fast diagnosis are critical to optimising patient outcomes. We also look to support research teams who need to access large cohorts of patient data to advance clinical studies and better understand all aspects of disease.